When most people think of Sardinia, the second largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, they may conjure up images of its pleasant climate, beautiful beaches, and epic scenery. Most though rarely think of the island's ancient history, and when they do, it's generally within the context of the great Roman civilization that was based just a few hundred kilometers east across the Tyrrhenian Sea. That may be the reason as to why Sardinia's own indigenous, nuragic civilization had until recently been so overlooked by archaeologists and historians. In this episode though, you'll be introduced to this fascinating ancient civilization and the remarkable stone structures, called nuragi, that they left behind. So without further ado, let's begin. So, what was the Nuragic civilization? The term comes from the fortress tower type structures found all over Sardinia called Nuragi. With the earliest of these dating back to at least 1800 BCE, to date there have been over 7000 Nuragi found all over Sardinia. A good number can also be found on the island of Corsica. However, for this program, we're going to stick to Sardinia. Though it's known that the ancient inhabitants of Sardinia built them, it's not known why the Nuragi were constructed or what their true purpose was. It's easy to simply conclude by looking at these Nuragi that they were all fortresses, but closer examination reveals that this probably was not the case. It also doesn't help that the people of this civilization didn't leave behind any discernible form of writing or records. The first humans to arrive on Sardinia are believed to have come from mainland Europe around 18,000 years ago, but it's really around the 7th millennium BCE, during the Neolithic age, that large parts of the island, especially the northern and central regions, were settled. Over time, several early cultures developed, the most famous being the Ozieri and Bonanaro cultures. For the most part, Sardinia's early economy was based on farming, herding, and fishing with some trade between it and continental Europe, including the Italian peninsula. Around 2000 to 1800 BCE, it's believed that new groups from mainland Europe, who were part of what's today known as the bell beaker culture, came in greater numbers, and along with them, new technologies such as knowledge of casting objects out of bronze. It was around 1500 BCE that we start to see the construction of the megalithic towers that we today call Nuragi. Some of these towers could reach heights of nearly 30 meters. Though impressive, these structures are probably a shadow of what they once were before they were partially dismantled for building materials and damaged by the passage of time. Often found on the summit of small hills all over Sardinia, their actual purpose is still a mystery, though several hypotheses and theories abound. Due to their shape, as well as the presence of walls around many of them, some have speculated that they were some sort of defensive watchtower. Others, however, maintain the belief that they had some sort of religious significance or were used to mark the grave sites of important people, which actually did occur hundreds of years later when the Romans took over Sardinia. A simpler, more mundane explanation is that they were a form of ancient silo used to store grain and other foodstuffs. Perhaps all of these are true. Stefania Bagella of the University of Sassari writes, It's likely that, during the centuries when they were built, the Nuragi performed all material and symbolic functions necessary for Nuragic daily life within the context of a predominantly rural economy and of a society which at the same time was structuring itself hierarchically. Thus, while not being primarily and simply houses, the Nuragi were certainly used for dwelling purposes and household activities, as evidenced by numerous findings attesting to the preservation, preparation, and consumption of food, spinning, etc. Even though not being fortresses, they could well have been fortified places, in that they were made strong, and equipped to protect persons and property, and above all might have been visible signs of a tribal community's power and wealth and of territorial ownership and control in such a widespread and articulated manner as to be properly defined strategic. Without any writing or explanation from others in the ancient world, 
modern archaeologists have been able to do little more than speculate as to what the true role of the Nuragi may have been. The Nuragic people weren't only skilled stonemasons, but metal workers as well. In fact, they produced a whole assortment of bronze and later iron objects such as swords, daggers, axes, statues, jewelry, and many other useful and decorative items. While Sardinia has ample copper deposits, the local smelting and casting of bronze means that Nuragic metalsmiths also needed tin, which had to have been imported offshore. It's believed that much of the tin used in Sardinia at the time came from the Iberian Peninsula, but some of it may have also come from areas around the Aegean. In fact, pottery dating back to the 14th century BCE, with both Minoan and Mycenaean designs, have been found on Sardinia. In many cases, the reverse is also true. Distinctly Nuragic bronze objects have been found in many parts of the Aegean and Greater Mediterranean region, implying that traders from Sardinia were part of several maritime trading networks. Though they didn't leave behind any sort of discernible writing, there have been many oxhide ingots found at various Nuragic sites. The many Nuragi artifacts uncovered all over Sardinia have given archaeologists clues as to what life in Nuragic society may have been like. Hundreds of bronze statuettes have been found portraying all sorts of figures. Some of them are wearing cloaks and holding staffs. These are believed to have been representations of chieftains or other rulers who were the leaders of their respective clans, and for whom the Nuragi towers may have been built for. Under them were the common people, who lived in nearby villages or stone roundhouses with roofs made of straw. These people are also represented by bronze statuettes and figurines and include people from all rungs of society. Warriors, farmers, artisans, miners, musicians, and even wrestlers. There are many scholars who believe that the late Bronze Age inhabitants of Sardinia and Sicily, and probably also Corsica, were among the migrants and marauders known to us as the Sea Peoples, who raided through the Aegean, Western and Central Anatolia, the Levant, and the Nile Delta, bringing about the collapse of Mycenaean civilization, the Hittite Empire, and the loss of Egypt's possessions in Canaan. One of the groups of sea peoples mentioned in Egyptian texts was the Sheridan, who scholars such as Giovanni Ugas claims were members of the Nuragic tribes from Sardinia. Though there may have been turmoil in the east, life seems to have pretty much carried on relatively uninterrupted on Sardinia shortly after the so-called Bronze Age collapse. In fact, during the Iron Age, it may have even gotten better for many of the island's residents. Between the years 900 to 500 BCE, archaeologists have found that the quality of ceramics, tools, and weapons greatly increased. There also seems to have been an increase in the island's population, which is always a good sign. Even politically, there were huge changes, as some scholars have even proposed that many areas had a sort of parliament that was composed of village heads and other influential people who would gather to address issues of mutual concern. It's also during this time that the construction of Nuragis started to decrease and pretty much by 1000 or 900 BCE ceased altogether. It was perhaps due to this increased prosperity, as well as Sardinia's strategic location in the center of the Mediterranean Sea, that around 900 BCE, various peoples from the east, especially Phoenicians, began coming to the island in greater numbers for trade and to acquire elements such as zinc and lead. Many of them ended up settling there and establishing small communities of their own. For the most part, their relationship with the local Nuragic peoples was peaceful and mutually beneficial. In 540 BCE, the Carthaginians launched an attack on Sardinia, but ironically, it was the Phoenician populated cities on the coast that suffered the most. Though their initial campaign ended in failure, the Carthaginians under their leader, Hamilcar, were able to take over most of the island. It's very likely though that many Nuragic settlements in the interior remained outside of Carthaginian control. Shortly after their defeat in the First Punic War, which ended in 241 BCE, the Carthaginians surrendered their claim to Sardinia to the Romans. By 238 BCE, the Romans had completely taken over the island, 
reportedly without any resistance from the locals. Politically, they combined it with neighboring Corsica into a single province. Despite this, the Greek geographer Strabo claims that Nuragic culture survived on Sardinia well into Roman times. So, I hope that this program has introduced you to the Nuragic civilization of Sardinia. Once again, thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. If you learned something or simply just enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button because it helps the channel out a lot. Also, check out the History with Sai podcast where I go into more detail with regard to some of the topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care and stay safe.